thanks to uh, uh, IDC and the organizers for uh, giving us the opportunity to do this work and to present it here. Um, and uh, as you've already heard, this is a joint work with Dr. Taik and uh, Ajay Shah. So uh, I'll uh, give an introduction, talk about the data the results. I'll show you a lot of pictures and then some brief conclusions. Uh, the motivation for this is, is pretty straightforward. Um, financial globalization has been very much a, a fact of life for several decades now. And the impacts of large uh, international capital flows on emerging markets have been uh, a source of great attention and uh, concern. And for India, uh, here's an example uh, of the kind of uh, things that worry policymakers. Here's uh, the Governor of the Reserve Bank of India in February uh, of this year saying, the other concern is the way we are financing it. We are financing our current account deficit through increasingly volatile flows. Uh, instead, we should ideally be getting as much of FDI as possible to finance the current account deficit. On the other hand, what we are getting is a lot of volatile flows to finance it. So these volatile flows of hot money is uh, basically portfolio flows. And um, we're uh, uh, asking some, base in this paper uh, and some previous work, we're asking some basic questions about uh, uh, what is the impact of these uh, so-called volatile flows? And uh, you know, there's there's obviously a much uh, larger context and larger concerns in terms of you know macroeconomic stability. What happens to the exchange rate? What happens to uh, uh, fiscal deficits and so on? Uh, can you finance the current account deficit? Uh, you get instability, we've already come through the financial crisis, the global crisis. And uh, uh, the connection to growth, of course, is that macroeconomic instability can uh, derail uh, the country's growth. So uh, that there is, I, I think, a uh, you know, very important larger context. But the, the approach we're taking here is to say, well, you know, people are worried about these issues uh, because they're important, but often the concerns of policymakers are being expressed without looking very carefully at what actually happens. And so that's all we're doing in this paper is saying, well, let's see what actually happens and decide then whether uh, based on that we should be worried or not. And so uh, it's a very, very simple uh, strategy here, let's look at the data. Okay, so policymakers care especially about crises, and the, the key idea here is that uh, what happens in stressful market conditions may differ from day to day outcomes, and I'll expand on this how, how this uh, influences our methodology, but that's really uh, what, what we focus on, and which is in some sense the key innovation of our work. And what we do is we use an event study methodology. We actually take a, uh, something that has been uh, there for many decades in the traditional finance literature, but we adapt it and operationalize it in a new way to look at uh, the issue that we're interested in. And so just, just to give you a preview, the, um, I'll explain a little more uh, shortly that uh, the events that we look at uh, are extremes of stock returns or net foreign institutional investor flows. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of institutional background on what an FII is. But this is different from you know, the, the classic finance studies, of course, were event studies were you know, uh, announcements of a stock price split or a merger announcement or something and see, well, do, do you see that in the market data, price data? For example, before the, the uh, uh, announcement, which would be an indication of you know, the information leaking out or something like that. So, uh, so a little bit of institutional background. Uh, India allows uh, portfolio flows pretty freely, and of course, that's the uh, uh, the key idea here is that you know, this is what sometimes colloquially would be called hot money. It can come in, go out. There's no restriction. In, in that sense, 
there is a restriction in the sense that you cannot uh, directly invest. To, if you're a foreigner, you can't directly invest money in India. You have to be a registered institution. That's what an FII is. And there is now a move to relax those uh, restrictions. But as far as I know, those haven't, uh, those relaxations haven't come into force. So um, the uh, uh, requirement to be an FII can be a mutual fund, a hedge fund, private equity firm, whatever, you know, investment banks. So th there's uh, a large number of these FIIs, and every, uh, all, all, the, all the data then, uh, foreign, foreign uh, portfolio data is, uh, uh, is logged uh, with uh, the Securities and Exchange Board of India. That's uh, what gives us our uh, data set. So uh, the uh, the questions we're going to ask then uh, in this in this paper, and I'll just uh, come back to this in a moment. But this is actually a sequel uh, to um, our first paper, which is also an IDC <coughs> project, where we looked at. Uh, aggregate data, aggregate flows and impacts on the Indian stock market as a whole. And here what we're doing is now we're drilling down to the level of, um, of individual firms and trying to get a sense of what happens at the uh, perhaps the sectoral level or the individual firm level. And in, in some sense if, if you're uh, a policy maker, your, your first order concern would be at the macro level but you might also be concerned about you know, where the money is coming in, is it you know, coming into a particular sector, destabilizing the sector, and so on. And that, again, would feed into macroeconomic concerns because some sectors may have uh, a greater impact uh, on business cycle uh, fluctuations and so on. So our first question is, do foreign investors worsen negative performance of the shares of a domestic company by withdrawing capital on a large scale? So that's one kind of destabilization and very specific uh, kind. And uh, uh, sometimes one is most concerned about this issue of withdrawal of funds. I gave you a quote from uh, uh, Subarao, uh, Dr. Subarao, and uh, of course he's concerned because this uh, these portfolio flows are helping to finance the current account deficit, and he's concerned that, oh, if that money suddenly uh, flows out, uh, it's not locked into India, but that will have a negative impact. So, uh, on the other hand, when we started this project uh, about two and a half years ago, if you remember, the concern was the opposite. There was a period where there were very heavy inflows, and the rupee was appreciating, and the policymakers were concerned about that. So, uh, you can have concerns in both directions, too much, too, you know, uh, in one way, too much, the other way. and. Uh, so it's also interesting to, uh, to look at the question of is there asymmetric behavior with different responses to very good versus very bad days in the local economy. Uh, two more questions. Uh, this, is, this is in some sense the, uh, you know, the, the fundamental worry about emerging markets is that emerging markets are relatively small. There's huge amounts of global capital sloshing around and uh, uh, the concern is our foreign investors big fish in a small pond, do they, uh, do they you know, have large transactions which would kick off uh, big distortions, lead to overshooting and so on. And uh, one might be worried about emerging markets, uh, stock markets as a whole, and if you look at companies that would be, would be even more of a concern that the uh, share price of a particular company, which you know, even the big Indian companies are small by global standards, they might be unduly affected by these generations. And finally, um, when there are stress conditions in the global financial system, uh, do uh, uh, foreign investors withdraw capital on a large scale and thus act as a vector of crisis transmission? And that's another concern. Well, things are going very badly in the world. Uh, can we, uh, 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 by being open to this uh, so-called hot money, are we also opening ourselves to this uh, uh, to exposure to, global, to these uh, stress global conditions. So these, these are the uh, four kinds of questions we're going to look at. And uh, just, just to give you a, a, the, the, the contrast, um, the standard way to approach 
uh, these kinds of issues is through uh, something like, uh, you know, you could do a structural model, but uh, uh, mostly people would do some kind of variation of a vector order regression. And um, Eli and uh, Ajay and another co-author, Matthew Stigler, uh, for example, did a five-variable uh, vector order regression with uh, foreign institutional investment, uh, looking at the Indian stock market, the uh, US S&P 500, ADR premium, and the exchange rate. And uh, they, uh, uh, for example, found that shops to net uh, FI flows did not feed through to any of the other four variables. So this would, again, be something that would perhaps allow policymakers to sleep a little easier at night, that you know, this is not something that is leading to uh, instability, this, this uh, portfolio money moving, portfolio flows moving in and out. But what I want to emphasize here is that this kind of um, approach, which is you know, obviously a standard approach in, in uh, uh, empirical economics, uh, makes several assumptions. One is that uh, one is using a linear model, and one can relax that and allow for non-linearities at some, at some cost of uh, you know, computational uh, complexity and so on. But the other, the other uh, thing which is true about uh, econometric modeling in general, of course, is that one is looking at uh, average behavior because you're uh, averaging across time, you're, you're estimating these coefficients uh, basically as time averages. So in that sense, you're not allowing the uh, uh, behavior of uh, uh, behavior of crisis periods to be different from non-crisis periods. And again, I, I don't want to say that our approach is the only one. One can deal with that in this context by you know, uh, say, uh, allowing for some kind of switching models or uh, dummies and so on. But uh, again, there's some kind of, you're locked in, you're, you're sort of starting from a point where you have to then uh, uh, change things and you're some, somewhat locked into that parametric framework in particular. So uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what our approach is, is, is really to uh, uh, just focus on extreme events on the tails of the distributions. Okay. And I'll, I'll come, to the, uh, uh, come to the details in a moment, but uh, we, as I said, we already did this for, at the macro level, and uh, uh, the, the results were actually, I, I think, quite uh, reassuring in the sense that uh, we did find that on very good days in the local economy, foreign investors would bring in more money, sort of exacerbate the boom in the stock market. Uh, but on very bad days, there were actually no significant effects. And we did not see uh, short-term price distortions kicked off by uh, extreme days of foreign investment into India. So it wasn't like foreign investors are kind of roiling the Indian, Indian market. And, uh, Again, we also did not find any uh, evidence that, say, uh, uh, very bad days on, uh, in the global economy as, as proxied by what's happening to the S&P 500 index. So you can think of that index as, in some sense, aggregating uh, or the, the, the prices, uh, sort of Hayekian view that prices reflect information. So using that as, as a signal of global conditions, we didn't find that very poor days in the global economy were being were uh, kind of triggering or preceding exit by foreign investors from India. So I guess one could just stop there from the macro, at the macro level and say, well, don't worry too much. But uh, we also have this opportunity to dig down a little deeper and look at what's happening at the level of firms and, and uh, sectors. And uh, uh, something else that I'll, I'll just mention here that we're, we're working on is actually uh, starting to compare India with other emerging markets, and I think that will also be very interesting. So, um, the you, know, you might say, well, okay, we didn't find anything to worry about at the, at the macro level, but if, if you're, say, running a small, medium-sized company in India, then you might have some concerns. So, and policymakers might be concerned, as I said, about specific sectors. So, so I, th I think what we're doing here today is. Uh, is not uh, uh, is is not without additional value, marginal value. But our our starting point is that uh, uh, maybe the uh, uh, 
the worries of policymakers are uh, uh, greater than they necessarily should be given what the data shows. Okay, so uh, so the uh, earth, our earlier results suggest that the macroeconomic impacts of international portfolio flows may not be too worrying in the Indian context, and there's still the possibility that stocks of individual companies may be affected in ways that cause concern. Um, now, the international finance literature, there's a lot of papers on the role of foreign investors in emerging equity markets, and very often they focus on whether uh, investors uh, move these markets towards or away from a fundamental value. And that's a very important question, uh, very, not just academically from the perspective of economic theory in markets, you know. Uh, our markets, uh, do markets work well or not? Uh, are we close to some theoretical ideal? But um, uh, in, in some sense, uh, a policymaker may not care about that. If the market is gyrating wildly and he thinks, he or she thinks it's because of foreign investors, it's not a, it's not a great comfort to the policymaker to say, well, actually, we're moving closer to fundamental value, so there's nothing to worry about. You know, what they're concerned about really is just uh, extreme movements, not movements relative to fundamentals. And that's, in some sense, we're focusing on that very simple simple uh, question and saying, well, what actually happens? So in some ways, our task is easier than trying to tease out uh, the issue of whether it's stabilizing or destabilizing relative to a fundamental value, which raises a lot of issues in terms of trying to figure out what that fundamental value is, of course. Um, so now uh, that, that's the end of the introduction. I'll, I'll uh, describe the data and methodology to you and then show you uh, a bunch of pictures. And uh, after a while, you, they'll probably all look the same. So I'll, I'll uh, I have some uh, wiggle room to stop uh, whenever I. So I, I didn't notice when I started, but just uh, let me know. About 18 minutes. 18 minutes, OK. So um, um, we actually have transaction level data from uh, Securities and Exchange Board of India, SEBI, and we aggregate that to daily data for individual companies, and we have about data on about 2,000 firms. The sample period is from 2003 to 2011, uh, so we have uh, uh, about uh, somewhere close to 2,000 daily observations, and uh, we have uh, data on company stock price returns, these company level FII flows, which are constructed from the SEBI data. And of course, we also have uh, used data on the S&P 500 index. Um, so um, uh, basically, we, uh, we construct uh, uh, this measure of changes in the daily FII holdings. We normalize by the daily, daily uh, total shares um, traded in that company to have uh, a normalized measure, and that's what we use as our measure of net, uh, net foreign institutional investment flows. There are, are some, uh, there's more detail in the paper, there's some unexplained discrepancies between this uh, transaction level data which we've aggregated to the daily level, and additional quarterly level data which is publicly reported by SEBI. So we did some uh, uh, trimming and adjustment to deal with it. There's a few, uh, few uh, data points that basically we, we leave out to avoid uh, avoid this. Uh, yeah. Very quick clarifying question. Uh, is there no anonymity of trading? Actually, the uh, there isn't anonymity in the sense that SEBI knows the identity of each uh, uh, FII's trade. We haven't been provided with the, what the net change in holdings is on that day. But uh, yeah, the, the uh, identities are protected, so uh, no worries there. Yes. <laughs> uh, but you have the total uh, transactions by the FIAs, right? That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, so we, we basically aggregate a, a net figure of the total. So just, just to give you an idea, uh, this is, uh, so the, there's about a thousand, on average, a thousand daily purchase transactions, a similar number of daily sales transactions. The quantity of shares traded daily is about 135 million on average. 
and the value of shares very daily is about 38 billion rupees on average. Is daily produced in fact for the, all the stocks together or for particular stock or? Um, I'm, this is, yeah, this is for all, all, all stocks, yeah. So, Eva, if I say anything wrong, just it's, correct it's me. Just yeah. So, they had, so we have put this data out on their website where they had an, uh, a fake identification number so that one couldn't track uh, what was the, that was the original so one could act on that. It would say FII yes. for all the FIs, but we mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I said we have data on 2,000 firms, but uh, Really, most of those firms are not of interest to uh, and not traded much by foreign institutional investors. Um, the, uh, uh, it, it, this, this tells us the number of firms comprising X percent of the FIA trade value where X is 85, 90, and 99 percent. And we've reported it by year. You can see obvi obviously that the numbers are going up reflecting more foreign investment in India over this period. Uh, but you can see that for 2011, once you look at uh, these uh, top 384 firms, that captures 99% of the FII trade value. So basically, we just focus on, on these firms. Okay. And here's, uh, uh, so out of that 384, uh, I'll show you, uh, in our results, we look particularly particularly at the top decile and bottom decile. So the, this top decile is by trade volume, right? So these are the most traded firms. And so there are about 40 of them here. And you can see there's a lot of uh, uh, financial firms, banks. Um, and uh, there's, uh, uh, I think this is mostly banks, but you've also got Tata Steel, uh, some oil and petroleum companies. Uh, and hmm? Got that. 23 banks out of 38. Okay, yeah. Six yeah. oil companies. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, engineering firm like uh, Larson and Tubro, I'll show you their individual results later. Some uh, electricity firms. Actually, so one thing we, we realized when we did this, so here we're, we're segmenting by trade volume, right, the most traded firms. And uh, when we looked at this, we, we realized that it, it will also be interested in, of interest to look at sectoral differences, and we haven't done that yet. So I mentioned that as something we, we uh, the, uh, of interest in this project, but I don't have those results today. Um, but um, uh, the idea here is that by looking at the, so here's what we're, we're trying to do. If, if you think about the, our original results for the market as a whole, right? You could say, well, maybe we shouldn't be too surprised because the Indian stock market is uh, relatively liquid. There's, there's quite a bit of trading in the Indian market. It's well run, you know, it, it, uh, uh, it's got one of the best electronic uh, settlement systems in the world. And, and uh, um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's not surprising you don't see uh, wild gyrations being caused by uh, foreign, foreign portfolio investors. But it's possible that within that uh, market there could be you know, thinly traded firms who's, uh, who, who would be much more affected by uh, you know, large foreign trades. And that's what we're going to look at today in particular. Look, we're going to compare what happens to the, the top decile, the most traded firms, out of those uh, almost 400 firms, and then look at the bottom bottom decile and kind of compare those results for you. Um, so the bottom decile firms are actually much more uh, much more diverse, and uh, uh, you know, some names that uh, may be much less familiar, uh, like lovable laundry. And, uh, uh, sorry. You have to point that out. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 well. That's uh, just, just to help you wake up, you know. So, okay. Um, the, um, yeah, there's also Eros International Media. Okay. Um, okay. The, uh, yeah, so there, there's a lot more diversity here that you can see. Right? Uh, so I, I think that issue of the, I don't, I don't know the answer, but it's obviously interesting that there's a lot of banks in that uh, top, top. Uh, so one thing we're not uh, 
uh, identifying obviously is you know what are FI strategies and how and as I said we can't because we can't have tell who's who's trading on that side we can't say well okay this is you know uh, certain kinds of FIs might have different uh, uh, you know, different strategies investment strategies and other kinds of FIs. Okay, so now I'll, I'll describe the methodology and then uh, get to the, the pictures and uh, I'll, I'll, I think you'll, once I show you the pictures, you'll understand the methodology. So I, I'll, I'll skip the technical stuff, but basically we're, we're treating extreme events and those are essentially tail events, right? So we're looking at two and a half percent tails um, on either side of the mean. So that means if we have 2,000 daily observations, we're looking at uh, 50 observations in each tail okay, for a particular company. Now, of course, uh, uh, some companies may not be traded every day, so we have fewer observations. And that's part of the reason for not looking at uh, just at individual companies, but for looking at groups of companies, is simply because uh, uh, we want to have enough observations. Because you know, again, if, if you're doing a VAR, you, you know, 2,000 observations, if it shrinks to 600, you've still got a lot of observations if they're not trade every day. But here, uh, you know, once you're looking at just the tails, then you start to uh, you know, get, get small, uh, very small samples. Okay, so as you'll see, we, we uh, uh, use as our starting point uh, what is an extreme event. Uh, different variables at different times. We can look at Indian stock market returns, uh, Indian stock returns, or S&P 500 uh, stock returns. Uh, so S&P 500 returns or net FI flows. And so we have a distribution for each, uh, for whatever subset we're looking at. And we can, we st we can start with the, uh, the subset that is the 2.5% tail on the side of that distribution. So uh, uh, the idea is that we look at uh, all those tail events and uh, say we're looking at the upper tail. So those, let me use as an example, uh, the uh, uh, say um, um, Axis Bank, okay, that was, I think in that uh, list there, and I'll show you the individual results. So for Axis Bank, suppose we have uh, uh, 2,000 observations and we have 50 in the upper tails, that means that for, for the stock returns, that means that those were the 50 days where you had the biggest positive movement you know, uh, in uh, uh, the Axis Bank uh, stock price, and positive movement relative to you know, the, the, the price of the express as a return, rate of return. Okay, so maybe it went up by 5% in a particular day, and that was you know, a very, very good day for Axis Bank. But is the benchmark like you know compared to some you know, some index or no? So we're just we're just looking at th that particular distribution and we're just uh, looking at the tails of that distribution. So uh, uh, we want to look. So we, we look at uh, these uh, you know, good days, say, uh, and we look at them separately from bad days. And then if we have fifty of those days, we can see okay, what is in some sense an average good day. An average extreme event for a particular uh, particular stock, right? And we could do that for FI flows. What are, what is? We could look at the 50 uh, days where there was the biggest inflow into uh, Access Bank, right? Because F, uh, FI uh, net purchases in Access Bank, and we can uh, uh, look at the average for those uh, those uh, 50 days. These are distributions for each stock. Yeah. And in and some cases, you're looking at the tails of the Yeah, so we're looking at the tails. But it doesn't, one nice thing about this is we don't have to place any distributional assumptions, right? So uh, we don't require any normality, symmetry, anything like that. We just look at the, you know, the 50, 50 biggest, 50 smallest, or 2.5%. Um, so, um, so we identify these extreme events, we look at, uh, in some sense, an average extreme event. So we are doing some time averaging after restricting ourselves to these extreme events, and we need that in order to be able to do some statistical inference. But uh, the advantage is that we're, we don't have to place any kind of assumptions uh, about the, uh, uh, the nature of the distribution, 
and so the, the, this entire exercise is, is uh, non-parametric. Um, but we want to look at what happens before and after an extreme event. Right? And you, again, you see from the pictures what, what we can learn from that. And that's uh, a choice that is somewhat arbitrary. We look at five trading days before and five trading days after. Uh, there's also issues of clustering of events because suppose you have two very good days in a row or, or two very bad days in a row, how should you treat those? And in our earlier paper, we looked at it both ways. You can either treat them as individual events or you can treat them as together as a, you know, a single extreme event. And so here I think I'm presenting results where we treat them as a, as a single event. So we just cluster them together. Yeah, so you are defining the events on the basis of the daily transactions of FII? Start out with, we, sometimes we'll do it with FII, sometimes with stock return, sometimes with S&P 500 return. But wouldn't so, the stock uh, uh, changes have happened as soon as the announcements were made and not actually when the FIIs were traded? Right, so, so here there's no announcements. We're just uh, seeing what happens on a good day. Let, let me get to the pictures and I'll, I'll, I'll just show you an illustration. So a description of, of uh, what we're doing. So basically for each event window, we calculate the cumulative returns of flows. And as I said, we average across all event win windows of the same type. And then basically we're just doing bootstrap inference. We sample with replacement from the set of event windows on a thousand times to generate the confidence intervals. Okay. So now I'm going to show you the pictures. And I think that, I hope that's uh, pretty visible. Um, Okay. Yeah, I just did two thousand daily observations, and so we we are looking at uh, fifty the fifty best days on the S and P five hundred, and we say okay, what what happens to um, FI flows into India on very good days on. Uh, the global market, yeah. How do you define the time period? I mean, uh, this is good days and bad days, which year? This is from 2003 to 2011. So we look at the, so that's 2000 daily observations. Okay. We look at the 50 best days out of those 2000. So there is some time averaging involved here. Uh, so it's, uh, it's the average extreme event, if you like, you know, that we're looking at here. So you can see that on average, the, uh, uh, there's uh, no increase in FI flows into um, into this this set of this set of firms. Okay, so this is about 40 firms, 38 firms, and there's there's no on on this day, which is one of the uh, best days on the global market as the global economy as measured by the S and P 500. There's really no. Uh, net inflow into these uh, uh, 38 firms, but you can see that after that, uh, there's uh, a cumulative inflow into. Yeah, there's a twelve and a half hour or a nine and a half hour. Okay, so okay, so so we're we're correcting for that. So the uh, uh, this is the the following day on the Indian market. So that's already taken account of here, right? So um, so this is the response on the the Indian morning following the, the U.S. night. Okay. So uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's as contemporaneous as you can get. No, there's another way to do this. When uh -huh. you look at ETFs, which are traded during the day, uh -huh. so which are being traded contemporaneously. Okay. Well, thanks. That, 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 I hadn't thought of, we hadn't thought of that, so that, that's something we look at. But uh, to in the, into these firms, the days after a very good day, and you have to you have to uh, temper that then by the confidence interval. So you can see it's a pretty wide confidence interval. So uh, so actually, uh, for almost the entire uh, period, the, these four, first four days afterwards, the confidence interval includes zero. So I can't necessarily say that this is uh, uh, you know, the pattern. It could actually be. Uh, down here. So um, uh, you can see that uh, uh, 
the behavior is somewhat asymmetric in the sense that uh, there's a quicker response, if you like, for very bad days. You are seeing a net outflow. Uh, there's a little bit more uh, sort of persistence there, but it actually levels off. So it's not like it falls off a cliff there. So I hope, I hope the, the graph is clear in terms of what we're seeing here. So these are... So the SNP good days three. means that it goes three. So three. The holding goes up. Uh-huh. But they, they're asking me questions, so you have to, uh, uh, you have to give me extra time. <laughs> okay. You can deduct us no, the, from our But, but our once, you've seen, once you've seen a few graphs, that, that, that'll be. Okay, so, so basically these are cumulative, right? So this is uh, cumulative flows. And you can see that, so this is a little bit negative, though again, the confidence interval includes zero. But you're seeing uh, you know, somewhat of a cumulative uh, positive trend after, the, after a very good day on the global market, S&P 500. And here you're seeing somewhat more contemporaneous uh, response. You know, bad day on, on the US stock market is pretty much contemporaneous with a net outflow from these, these uh, top decile firms. And there's some persistence after that, but then it, it uh, levels out, okay? So here when I'm seeing a, a flat, when it flattens out here, because it's accumulated, that means that there's no additional net outflow. So that now I'll, I'll, I'll uh, start to answer your question. So this is now, we're looking at a different uh, issue. Now the, the, looking at the S&P 500, that's exogenous to the Indian market. And here, of course, we're looking at two endogenous events relative to India. So here the event is uh, the returns on the Indian market and the response of FI. So the response variable is the same. But here you can see a very different pattern that on the Indian market, uh, there's actually somewhat of a, uh, the uh, uh, very good day on the Indian market is preceded somewhat by FI flows. In fact, uh, the cumulative increase is, is uh, uh, greater here just before the very good day on the Indian market. Um, and there's a little bit of persistence after that. And it's much less on the uh, negative side, in fact, this is pretty much flat after the, uh, the very bad day. So here what we're saying is, okay, look, there's a very bad day on the Indian market, at, at least for these top uh, decile firms, the ones that are you know, very actively traded by FIIs. And as you might expect, there's some withdrawal of funds by FIIs on that day. They're part of this, uh, they're part of this uh, you know, market retreat. But then you're not seeing that uh, leading to some kind of collapse of the, of the share prices, the stock returns basically level out after that. Okay. Now, if you look at the reverse, you can sort of see the, uh, you know, the, not surprisingly, there's a, there's a kind of uh, obverse effect here, where now the uh, event now is, is the cumulative change in the stock return. So this is a very, very good day on average for these uh, top decile firms. And uh, this is, uh, how, uh, oh, no, yeah, sorry, now this is uh, a very good day in terms of FI inflows. Okay. So FI inflows are, um, uh, th th this is when there's a, a big net purchases of these, the, the stocks of these firms, and you can see that the, uh, there's some uh, preceding time where you, you have a, a, an increase in the stock returns, so mostly it's coming right here, and then you see a, a little bit of persistence and uh, then a leveling off. I guess if the market were absolutely uh, perfect, if, if FIs were coming in, uh, if there was a big net increase, you would basically see a leveling off right away. And typically we see sort of one more day of, of persistence in terms of the price adjustment. So this is sort of price adjustment story to the FIs coming in. Again, you have, a sort of, you have some symmetry here on, uh, on the negative side, it's a little smaller, but you see that uh, uh, if there's a, a very, if there's very sharp outflows from these these uh, 38 firms, there's uh, um, some drop in, in the firm's uh, uh, stock stock returns that day, but then it tends to level off very very quickly. So that's for the, the top decile. For the bottom decile, because they're, they're less uh, often traded, actually the confidence intervals are very, very wide. 
So uh, uh, from the confidence intervals, you can't say very much, but uh, you see that there isn't really uh, any, any, any very uh, surprising action. This is the S&P 500. You can see a little bit of as more asymmetry here in terms of uh, uh, response of FIIs to changes in the, the stock returns. And again, similarly here. So, you know, so here we're, we're, we're not doing a structural causal story, right? The, the, these are both endogenous variables. But all we're saying is, look, when uh, there's a lot of money coming in, you do see some impact on the Indian stock market. But it's, it's not like it's, it's a huge impact and it's not like it's uh, leading to some, uh, you know, some uh, uh, destabilization that you know, it, it, it's uh, pushing things way, way away. And in fact, on the negative side, we're not seeing much at all. Okay, so. Um, I have shared with you that I'll, 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 I'll wrap up. Okay, so, um, um, so that's basically, uh, the, the story is that uh, uh, even for these thinly traded firms, the, the situation doesn't look too bad. Remember I said, okay, we looked at the macro story, it was fine. And we looked at these, uh, you know, the most traded firms, it doesn't seem like it's something as terrible is going on. And even when we get down to these thinly traded firms, now it may be that when you get to the really thinly traded firms, obviously one trade, whether it's domestic or foreign, could have a big impact, but then we can't really do the statistical inference at all. Okay, so the rest of this is what happens with individual firms. And all I want to say is, um, so again, we have three pictures for each firm. And there's five firms, they're all in, in the paper. Uh, but what I want to say here is that uh, it kind of differs from firm to firm. Uh, the confidence intervals in general are wider because we have fewer observations once we get down to individual firms. So we can be less, uh, less confident about what's going on. And again, there's not really, I think, a single story you can say that uh, foreign investors are somehow uh, you know, roiling the markets or having a terrible impact on the markets uh, or on individual firms in the market. Okay, so, so you know, FII inflows are, are viewed as a potential contributor to growth along with FDI. And there is this idea that FDI is good and uh, F, you know, portfolio investment is not so good. And there may be reasons for that because FDI comes in with other, you know, other, other things like technology transfer and so on. But uh, certainly from the perspective of volatility, uh, which policymakers have serious worries about, what we're arguing is that there's no evidence in this data that sharp F FII outflows destabilize the Indian stock market in the sense of leading to further cumulative declines in share prices. Sometimes there are asymmetries of response to good and bad days, and we saw that particularly for individual firms, and more for the bottom decile than for the top decile firms. Um, FIs may lead or follow the domestic markets. You can see that it's not like uh, they're either stu you know, stupid or super clever. It's not like uh, one or the other. You know, sometimes they're a little behind the curve, sometimes they're ahead of it in terms of what's happening. And there's really no evidence of crisis transmission through foreign portfolio firms. So uh, uh, I think the differences across individual companies bear further investigation. I think we'll best be able to do that with the sectoral analysis, which we're we'll starting on now. So thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Now we have uh, Mr. Ronopong Kamla. Uh, he is the CEO economist and director general of NASCOM. He had his uh, graduation from IIT Kanpur and subsequently from Stanford University, his PhD analyst. And when I saw that term, that my title was to uh, my, the, I was labeled as the. Uh, as providing policy perspectives, I thought I'd do that and not play the role of the classic discussant, which was easy for me because although I find the econometrics very interesting, I, it's always I educate myself every time. I'm no, not an expert and I get lost. So I'm sure I've misunderstood many such th many of those things. Um, you know, I used to think econometrics was very easy, especially after having cut my teeth in Kalman filtering, you know, a long time ago. Uh, but uh, I find current econometrics too tough. Uh, the two papers are, uh, you, well, the, the, this one and the other one by Ila. I'll 
I have them together, but I will concentrate right now only on the first one. Let me just, the first point, I am going to focus it, uh, focus my comments from the point of view of policy relevance and implications. So, focus on the questions. Of course, uh, Nirvikar has already pointed out the key questions that he, they were trying to answer and the key concerns of policy makers. But I, actually, I, I find there are a whole bunch of things that one, uh, you know, have, which have a bearing on those questions when you start looking at the data that they were, they examined. And obviously, they have just begun uh, their um, dealing with that. Um, and then some questions arise just from looking at that data. And some of them are quite different from the questions that were specifically addressed in this. I feel this that sets an agenda for future research. I will try to give a little bit of a, a, a my take on the results and the interpretation. Um, some of, there are some slight differences from what at least is emphasized in the paper. And there are some interesting byproducts as far as I'm concerned. Turn and uh, let me come to that. As I've already said, I'm going to be relatively light on the econometric methodology or even some of the, the way they have uh, organized the data and collected the data. Lastly, I can't help but this is my constant refrain at all the IGC uh, last three conferences. And which is that this is again a missing middle. If I go through the count, all the papers that are present, presented, you have one on the one side all the papers on social sector, public service delivery, and so on. And then you have one that's very, very real, very true, very impacting people's lives. And then you have one which is all this high finance type of international capital flow. But really, I think actually at the heart of the story that, that is in here is the nature of the financial sector and the role it is playing or not playing in our domestic economy or in the international economy. That part somehow nobody seems to be doing any research. And I've been saying this to Montek, I've said it to Rakesh, and incidentally they all agree with me, but then they still don't ask anybody to do it, so I don't quite know what's going on. Okay, so let me start with the foreign investors under stress. Very quickly, uh, since uh, Nirvikar is going through all this, he, they basically use event studies, and as they say, these are not quite classic event studies. Uh, you know, when I did corporate finance and others in financial sector economics, uh, the idea was exactly merger, uh, uh, merger and acquisition announcement, or other, you know, some market shock somewhere or the other, or even some crisis announcement out uh, uh, sort of went to. Here, the closest that comes is that S&P event, which is some global turmoil, something or the other, not quite turmoil, and this is another interesting thing. The second event is stock, they are defining events in terms of certain episodes in the, in the stock market, you know, basically roughly 11 day, not quite 11 day. And lastly, they're looking both, how stock markets, uh, stock returns affect FII flows and FII flows stock return. The key finding, which is summarized, uh, stated very quite clearly is that FIs do not uniformly stabilize stock, destabilize stock markets, which is, but again, in terms of daily trading, that's what this is all about. Um, I don't think that they are, they are making the claim that when you have, you know, uh, anything to do with what we think, normally think in terms of contagion through the financial channel. That's not exactly what they're talking about. They're talking about daily trading. And in that sense, it raised, comes back to the question, if we think of financial sector, the key aspect of financial sector is the, you know, the daily gyrations and what's, whatever effects that they have on the, on the allocation. That's one part of the financial sector. Maybe reduce, increases liquidity, increases, sort of reduces financial friction. But in terms of what is it doing to the whole overall allocation of resources in the, you know, in the economy, it's, uh, it's um, somewhat, well, that question is sort of begged all the time. In fact, that question will come out at, in my comments when I talk on Ila's second paper. The point is, the other point is that they in, essentially the analysis deals with less than 20% of the total firms in, that they have data for, 384. And actually the first and second part, they take only about a fifth of each. Not even a fifth, yeah, fifth total. Um, which are, and these firms are somewhat atypical. And I think you need to think about the, the, what, your, what those firms are very differently in the top diesel and the bottom diesel. And that is part of that explains the result. They're quite clear, they are not gotten into the causation and they don't have a, in a model of what might be happening. But, uh, but it's, what I'm saying is they, the assembling of the data is a key contribution, raises interesting questions, and a lot more uh, research will be needed to find some actual policy implications. Uh, basically, what comes out is, as I, we, we were talking about, in the top 
38 firms, they're not B-side, 38 firms. 23 are types. Most, many of them are, uh, it, it, you know, some of them are even public sector types. Another six are oil companies, all except one is state-owned, if I remember correctly. And then there are only five private sector firms, really. Uh, and two more, sorry, telecom. And these are all f fairly special, you know, um, firms in many ways that m most of you will probably know. When you think about Reliance Industries, when you think about PCS, or when you think of Party Airtel, either. So when you think of the top D side, and you think you're a foreign investor, that represents a different play, and it's less to do with what you're, you're in, your, in your stock picking or anything like that, or what you're looking at when you're uh, relating to the stocks that you are uh, market that you are dealing with. It's more uh, so, and some of that will come out in the second paper. Then there is a very interesting analysis, and since I don't have time much more, I'll just focus on that because I know a little more about it. Three of them are our members, um, and these are five blue chip firms. What they tell you, in fact, they say the banks are somewhat understandable. There's the Axis Bank and then the big government, much more globalized ICICI Bank. If you think about the basic model they have, the ICICI Bank in some ways is the more typical of what you want. In fact, actually in ICICI Bank, you see that the financial uh, gyration, uh, or variation, uh, variations filter through in both in the positive and negative sense. The, uh, but in the, in the uh, IT companies, whether it's Infosys, TCS, they find that the results puzzling, but because that you know you have and but it sort of feeds into it does contribute to the point that they make. Simply one simple point they make is that the foreign investors actually when the stock market goes down or their stock returns go down, the financial firms in the market say, hey, this is underpriced, so they come and fish, and they they will sort of pick up those stocks, and so that actually stabilizes. So I'm not, what I'm trying to say is that the real interesting meat of the story is in the, in the, in the, in the detail. So um, I have a whole bunch of things, but I think I'm already but I've run out of my time. So let me just, um, yeah. So I'll just come up with some of the policy implications. One of them is that it's the, it becomes very clear how concentrated FDI is. And we'll again come back to that, so I won't dwell on it. But more even that, more concentrated is the trading that's going, going on. You know, in fact, 92 firms account for 85% of the trading. We're talking about 99% being 80. So, you know, the the other part is, and that comes out if you go into the detail, is that perhaps there are different players, the different FIIs are playing in different markets. And we don't have any of that source information here. But there's enough. Uh, to point you to in that, in that direction. And that brings me to the bigger question of, you know, okay, we focused on FDI, but if you really want to think who's doing what, what benefits does FDI bring? And this is where this, uh, Nevika referred to the difference between FII and FDI. I think we really need to distinguish between them. FII just brings uh, capital, and FDI brings more than, it's not just a question of technology, it, Supposedly also brings entrepreneurship in certain sectors where we are underdeveloped. It brings access to markets. Now sometimes that access to markets, and that's what's happening in Infosys story, can actually be a source of another vulnerability in terms of globalization because companies like Infosys are heavily dependent on international market. So I'm not saying that it is necessarily less deep stabilizing in terms of, um, you know, con from contagion point of view, but what I'm trying to say is that the story is quite different by sector. Lastly, there's a point, and I'd like to say to, for policy, you make a point, Nervakar, that, um, act, that policy makers are more concerned about the extremes. Yes, when you're focusing only on the cost side of foreign investment, actually most of us, many of us, are also very concerned about the benefit side, which is what I was referring to. And there, the average relationships are actually very important, so I would like to sort of stress that, that we need to do more on that. And I've already referred to the other ones and uh, the other two, so I'll stop now. And perhaps some of the things will get picked up in the second half. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Dr. Kamla. Now we'll open the floor. And I'm afraid we cannot take many questions. Uh, 
one of the graphs which is saw that like you know when the S and P 500 return goes up for good news, the stock returns of the Indian companies also tend to get to go up as well. Right? So it's kind of a positive co-movement. But this is actually kind of my first question would be like think about say like you know, why is it so? Because think about say an international if I is when they're kind of making a portfolio allocation between say, um, say Indian markets and the outside markets, right? So wouldn't you expect a negative um, correlation between the movement if there's kind of good news outside? So you typically you tend to shift your uh, portfolio from the domestic to outside. I mean, just to give you an example, I mean, typically, as they say in the in Wall Street Journal and other things, say that when there's this kind of good news in the US, or the, basically, investors say that they return to safety, right, in a sense. So, why is it, so is it due to kind of a lag in the you know, transaction timing between this or something else? I think that's kind of a, a, a first question. And uh, the second question is that, from the FIA's behavior, can you infer anything about the efficiency or any is the kind of informativeness of their, you know, like the strategies and etc. Like, is it FIA is a kind of a better compared to the others in terms of since you also can calculate their kind of a, you know, returns on the portfolio as well? Right? These are these two questions. Whether or not FIAs are uh, stabilizing or whether they are destabilizing. Um, one way to look at it is the way you've done, which is look at the extreme behavior. Uh, extreme behavior being 2.5% on one side, 2.5% on the other. Uh, another way to look at it would be to include the very rare events like a financial crisis. Now, uh, we haven't had a financial crisis in India, so uh, this kind of a study uh, excludes that. Uh, completely. Now, if you were to do a similar study with a similar methodology for East Asia and leave out 97, 98, take the periods before that and take the periods after that, then this would suggest that uh, the foreign capital is pretty stable in East Asia. Okay. But we know what happened in 97, 98. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of the concern with destabilization is to capture a possible 97, 98, which this doesn't do. Here about your identification strategy, uh, I'm seeing. I mean, there are lots of graphs you showed, and some of them it is clear. But on the downside, there's a negative. You know, there's a negative correlation. There's a positive correlation, okay, between uh, FII and, uh, and so. What is that really? Tell 2008 financial crisis, which resulted in what he describes as a, as a shrinkage of liquidity in the system, and so both from the fiscal and the monetary side, they felt a need to prevent a severe output contraction. Uh, they needed to uh, inject that stimulus and we are living with the consequences of that now. Second item was Mr. Chidambaram who we met two days ago. I mean, he was describing what's happening on the exchange rate. Of course, he's anxious to explain that he's not responsible. So he says, well, Mr. Bonangi on June 21st said this and this is the consequence. So if you look at other items, macroeconomic items, such as liquidity or looking at the exchange rate, the question is, you know, to what extent can we just go from uh, results on the stock market and make broader pronouncements about the macro yeah. Yeah. I also want to focus on uh, the macroeconomic implications. And one thing that is missing is the effect on the price of risk, the risk premium because of this. Uh, just take a very, very simple framework. You have good times. Uh, as indicated by uh, the Indian market going up and bad times when the Indian market is going down. Now, at least we've shown that when the market is up, there is actually positive flow. So that itself, even if I, even if it didn't go down, uh, uh, that would increase the risk premium. Okay, because what what increases the risk premium is anything that destabilizes the consumption. Um, you can't do this analysis on daily frequency. Just there's too much noise in there. You will have to do this uh, at uh, at least monthly frequency or something. Look at macroeconomic effects. Uh, these daily fluctuations, uh, there is no model. Uh, and, and 
there is no theory um, of, of which accounts for it. So I, I would look at, uh, uh, re-echo Anupam's point there, that if you want to do this thing um, as a microeconomic study, there are costs and there are benefits. Benefits are coming from integration, uh, global uh, integration. That will actually tend to lower the risk premium. Uh, and this kind of destabilization will increase the risk premium. We don't know how the net effects come through. But uh, that's something that would interest me a lot. Thank you. Okay. A decline in FII would be leading to a decline in the stock prices. But it might just be that the uh, lower the near market isn't doing too well, and that might be the reason why FFI is not being taken off. So they are, uh, they're causing and co they're highly correlated. They're causing and uh, being caused as well by the same thing. But wouldn't uh, wouldn't it help to choose uh, the FII outflow, which is not correlated to the Indian market? Uh, so then you can see the effect of the FII outflow on the Indian market without really having the Indian market causing this FII FI outflow. Uh, I don't know what, uh, maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a third market that might be not doing well. So FII outflow is independent of how the Indian market is doing. Uh, because when the Indian market is uh, down, then you would find that the, it would cause FII to outflow, and it might, the stock prices going down might not really be a result of the art actually might just be that the market is doing wrong on a down trend. So yeah, I think in some of the questions, what, what came out was that uh, the natural tendency is, is to look for structural explanations and you know, what's happening relative to fundamentals. And I have to admit again that we're, we're taking a very simple approach and we're sort of uh, punting on that. So. Uh, uh, but that's that's not to say that uh, uh, that that can't be done, and I I, I think uh, uh, hopefully you know, that's something we can we can add, and that would actually tie it in more with the other finance literature, which I kind of alluded to in the paper has some specific references. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, you know, are these really extreme events? And it, it, it's true. We're as I tried to stress, we're looking at the average extreme event, the average tail event. And, and so we're not capturing the black swans. Uh, that's, uh, I think, a, an issue. Are, are those uh, predictable? And can you say anything uh, you know, in terms of statistical inference when you have a black swan event? So uh, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure uh, what, what we can do there. Um, then I think uh, questions on uh, macroeconomic effects and uh, implications. Uh, again, yeah, you're absolutely right. We haven't really completely, we haven't really come to grips with that in the sense that the policymakers are worried about you know, a lot of things uh, having to do with you know, the fiscal situation, inflation, exchange rates. And in some sense, we're not providing an answer to any of those things. All we're saying is, you know, just focus on those things. Don't worry about portfolio flows. That's not your problem. That's not something you should be losing sleep over. Your problems are coming elsewhere in some sense. So that might be what, what we'd say. But uh, in, in, in terms of, uh, did it, in, in our, actually our first paper, we did look at uh, exchange rate and interest rate impacts too. And that's something we could also do at, at the front level. Of, you know, that, that sort of on the cards. And that would be actually interesting because it'd be interesting to see if, if uh, uh, there are uh, you know, connections for different types of firms with the, with the exchange rate in terms of the performance of different types of firms. Uh, again, I want to stress that we, we're, not, uh, we're not providing causal stories. So, you know, uh, we're used to using the term range of causality for you know, temporal precedence. But uh, here really, uh, you know, when, when I say something happens before, it's, it's really just something happens before. And what, I, what we're saying is, look, the patterns are not, you know, you don't have those graphs going off to plus infinity, minus infinity. In that sense, what we're saying is, yeah, you know, uh, you should, looking at five days after an extreme event is, is gonna give you a pretty good idea of what's, what's going on. So if the policymakers are really worried about volatility, uh, short run volatility, then they shouldn't be worried. Now, if, if, if you know, the macroeconomic situation is bad and foreigners are slowly losing confidence and 
you know, the, the money is sort of leaking out gradually over you know, weeks and months, we're not going to capture that. that. That's certainly true. But that's not what the policymakers are typically complaining about. If, if, they, if that's what they're worried about, then I think they need to articulate the, their concerns somewhat differently. And <clears throat> the point about the risk premium, I'll actually have to ask you, Rajneesh, because uh, I'm not a finance, uh, finance expert, but I'll, I'll uh, try to understand that from you. And uh, 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 Nisha, your idea is a good one, and that's something we can do. For example, the way I would do it is to look at the stock price return uh, relative to the overall nifty return. And that would allow us to filter out the, you know, the, what's happening to the market as a whole. But on the other hand, we're saying, look, you know, if you're just looking at this group of companies, this is what's happening in terms of FI, how FI flows are uh, you know, feeding into uh, the performance of this set of companies. Whether that is also happening to the market as a whole, we're not uh, we're not picking up, but we could do that by looking at the non-FII uh, uh, prompts that are created in the stock market. Uh, sorry. We could compare that to the non-FII's Indian prompts that are being created in the stock market. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We could do that too. That though, well, or, or we could just look at uh, the, average. Uh, the average. You know, that what's happening to the Nifty. That would that would give us a little bit better So we could actually compare our earlier macro aggregate results with the results here. We should do that. Thank you.